We're in a brand new series and we welcome you to Unconditional. And if you look at the graphic, whether it's on your app or if you're watching the website or, or maybe on your paper outline, the, the word unconditional is in bold letters, but there's a hidden word right underneath it. And it's, can you see it? L-O-V-E. And I hope that that is the first word that comes to your mind when you say unconditional. And we're going to talk about what love is. In fact, if you look at that title, it's love is dot, dot, dot. What is that? What, what comes into your mind right there? And I, and I think of <laughs> two statements. Love is complicated. Love is hard. Love is wonderful. Um, I, I think of silly statements that are made, like love is never having to say you're sorry. But I, I think we can all agree that love is so, so, so important. And so we're going to spend several weeks focusing on God's love and how that we experience it and how we begin to give it out. And I hope at the end of this series, our goal is that you would experience and understand the love of God in a, in a deeper, richer way, and that it would begin to flow out of your life to the people around you. So let me tell you a story that can set us off here or start us off. We, Jan and I were watching this uh, series on the History Channel, and it's called Alone. And the, the show is very interesting because it was a real survivor show, not voting people off the island. This is 10 survivalists that had experience and background, and they got to choose whatever you know, tools or whatever they wanted to take in. And, and they're dropped off in the North Vancouver uh, area, North Vancouver Island, and it's a very, very uh, rainforest kind of an area. Um, there's seven feet of rain a year, so everything is soaked and cold and just a tough place. And they, they were dropped off, you know, five to ten miles from each other. And so there's no camera crew, there's no lights, there's nothing like that. It's just them, and they have to set up their own camera gear once in a while and, and, and film a statement or tell about what's going on in their life. And we were watching it, you know, week after week, and the first couple of weeks, you know, there were people that, yeah, I don't know, they didn't want bear and, and uh, panthers around or cougars or whatever, so, so they tapped out pretty quickly. But, and then we're watching as some of them couldn't get their fires going and all that, and, you know, there was a contrast there. Jan and I are sitting there with our warm fire, eating popcorn, <laughs> going, boy, those guys are freezing and they're starving and they're eating seaweed and other disgusting things. And... Uh, and you think of all the things they were going through and really suffering and deprived of so, I mean, water and food, just the basics of life. And the ones that were there after more than a week or two, you know what they started talking about? How lonely they were. How, how much they missed their wife and their kids and their friends. And, and in fact, as it got later on and it was cutting down to who was left, they they would say things like, if I could just have five minutes to talk to my wife, if I could just have one hug, and, and it just emphasized in the midst of all of these things that they were without, the thing that they were starving for was love, was relationship, was connection. And so here's a spoiler alert if you haven't watched season one yet. So it comes down to this guy named Alan Kay, and, and he goes on for 56 days. And in fact, when he's finally, they don't know if other people have left or not. They don't know. He didn't know he'd won. And so they come in with a team of doctors and under the pretense of they're just going to give him a health check. And, and so they're checking his blood pressure and all that and doing a little dialogue with him. And, and then they're like, oh, by the way, uh, you won $500,000 for being the last survivor standing. And, you know, his, his lighting up just at seeing the people. And then they brought his wife around the corner or she walked in the trail and, and, uh, just as he hugged her and held her. And you just could see what an incredible relief. And I think that if you and I can be honest, one of the things we most desperately need is to feel loved, to know that we are loved because that is the source of so many things. And so I want to start us off with a very, very basic statement is that God loves me. I hope you can say that. God loves me. And we're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to look at a book that was written by the disciple that, that said Jesus is the one, I'm, I'm Jesus, the one he loves. <laughs> I think John had a t-shirt that said, Jesus loves everyone, but I'm his favorite. And in that 
understanding of Jesus when he was here. Then he writes later in his life, at the end of his life, these books of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, where he's talking about how important love is. So let's read a couple of verses there on the screen. And, and I think that it underscores what, um, there was a famous theologian named Karl Barth, and after many, many years of writing things like dogmatics and the deep, profound works of theology, he was, in 1962, at University of Chicago, he was lecturing a group of students, and after he was done talking about all these deep and profound concepts, he had a student say, can you, can you sum up your theology in one sentence? And without missing a beat, the theologian said, yes, I can. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's kind of what John says too. Watch this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. You talk about the, the most basic sentence as we talk about love, it is that God is love. And let me just contrast that for a minute. It's not that love is God. Some people live like that's the ultimate. And it is wonderful to be in love, and it's wonderful to be loved. I, I was watching a, a person that had been sort of an unmotivated and overweight and kind of demanding husband and, and uh, you know, kind of complaining about a lot of things. And, and then all of a sudden, he's finding himself divorced and he's alone, and all of a sudden, he... He, he kind of wakes up and, and now he's posting pictures of him going to the gym and getting in shape and, and how good he looks and how motivated he is and, and the new love of his life. And he put on there, I'm finally being loved like I need and want to be loved. And I thought, man, it's still all about me. It's still not, you haven't learned to love yet. You're just still looking for, and love is important, but love is not the total basis. We say love is, well, you can't say love is God. It's not the ultimate. It's the reverse, that God is love, that he's like the sun that sends the, the energy that comes onto our planet and all the animals and plants and everything is, is benefiting from the energy of the sun. And so we start with this clear and, and important picture that God is love, but there's an important deeper insight into that. Um, in English, the word love is kind of sloppy. It's just a huge category to where it's almost overused and meaningless. You can say you love chocolate ice cream. You can say you love your best friend. You can say you love your wife or your kids. And you can say you love the Seahawks. And you can say you love the weather. In other words, it just describes a positive feeling about things. And so that's not very helpful sometimes. And in the original New Testament, it was written in Greek, and the Greek language doesn't, no, no two languages correspond exactly to each other, but the Greek language has a number of words for love, and it's helpful when we look at those maybe to dial into a deeper, more precise, and honestly more beautiful understanding of what the word love means. And so, on the cross, on your, if you're taking notes there on the paper, on the right side of your sheet, there's just three of the words. These are not all of them, but these are the, the ones that are used in the New Testament. And the first is agape. And if you have been around the Bible world at all, you probably have heard that word. And that's, that's unconditional love we're talking about. It's the love that, first of all, comes from God. And then it is love that God tells us when, when you see the great commandment that we're to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. When, when love is commanded, it's agape. It's that it doesn't matter how you are today or what you are doing, I am going to love you. It's a choice love based on the heart of the lover. The next word is eros, and that is romantic and sexual love. And the Bible talks about that. And it is in, in God's creation of male and female. It's to be what part of what draws them together and part of what keeps marriages together. And that is a word separate from agape love. And then there's a third word called phileo, which is really about affection and care. If you say the word, if you say, 
well, I love you, but I don't really like you right now. You could say in Greek, well, I agape you, but I don't really phileo you right now. Because it, it has to do with the, that the person or the thing that you're loving has an attractiveness and there's something in that person that's drawing out your love. Now, all of those kinds of love are wonderful. But agape love has to be the foundation of them all. Because other loves are more shallow and they will not hold in the storms of life. And so I want you to think of another way, if we put it into English words, what agape means. You can say, I love you if. And quite often, honestly, that's the infatuation that starts romantic relationships. I will love you if you do this. And sometimes it's the way marriages continue and it's really manipulation. I'll do this for you if you'll do this for me. And it's, I will love you as long as you do this, but if you don't, then I will quit loving you. And then there's love because of, which really sounds so beautiful. Oh, you complete me. Or I love her because she has long wavy hair and she smells wonderful and she likes the same things I do and we never fight and we can talk about anything. Well, what if those change? What if she cuts off her hair and she still smells, but it's not wonderful? And you do fight. And maybe you haven't resolved things and so you're having a hard time talking about anything. And you don't necessarily like the same things anymore. You see what happens when your love is built on love because, that if those becauses go away, then your love is no longer strong enough, deep enough to hold on. And love regardless or love period is what agape love is about. And so when we say the word, God loves me, what we are saying is that regardless of how I'm pleasing him or how I'm behaving or what I'm doing, regardless of all those things, I have this intense and incredible and loyal and focused personal love that God is giving to me. And I couldn't say a more basic sentence to you in a a Bible teaching, in a Bible study, but I want you to ask, ask you that question. Is that how you really feel? And I kind of flipped through these pictures earlier, and this is actually a drawing that somebody gave me recently, and it it shows a shepherd holding a lamb, and in the hand of the shepherd, there's a hole where, obviously, that's Jesus. And And I guess I want to ask you that deeper question. When I say, God loves you, and when you're sitting there thinking, do I really know that? Because I think some people feel like, well, I'm too unworthy. They've if you knew the things I've done, you would know that God, he maybe loves me, but he doesn't like me. He, he can't really love me. Or maybe you feel like, I think probably my tendency is I feel like God loves me kind of like a, a class action suit. Like he loves humanity and I'm part of humanity. But sometimes I lose that sense that God loves me individually. In fact, in your devotions this week, you're going to read Psalm 139 and it says, He knows every word before it comes out of your mouth. He knows where you go. And and there's this very personal, individual picture. Sometimes I think you and I wrestle with, I don't know that God loves me because I'm kind of disappointed in God right now. He hasn't done what I thought he should. He hasn't given me what I need. He hasn't protected me. Maybe even I'm angry with God. And so I think before this series is going to really have much impact on you, you've got to do some internal dialogue and say, do I or do I not really believe that God, can can I get that picture that that I'm a lamb, that he's enveloped in his arms and that he cares deeply and personally and unconditionally for me? Because I'm telling you, everything else in this series has to flow out of understanding how deeply I am loved. Because love is essential for me. It's, it's lesson one in spiritual journey. It's, it's the foundation for everything. And when that foundation erodes or gets cracked in any way, everything starts falling apart. And so what we've just read is that love is from God. That in fact, that's really the core story of the gospel. And think about this clearly. If you talk about where did it all start in creation, Well, God loved us so much that he made us. In fact, he made us 
with the capacity for relationship. And when he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he, he walked and he talked with them and, and they had relationship with each other and they had relationship with God. And, and there was this perfect love. That's, that's why he created us, to share that love with him. And then if you think about the fall and they intentionally sinned and did what was wrong. And, and first of all, their relationship with God was broken and, and they were hiding from God. And then their relationship with each other was broken because before that, they had been naked and unashamed, com- not just physically, but completely vulnerable and open to each other. And then in the fall, they, they hid from each other. They put clothes or leaves on. And then they started throwing each other under the bus. Lord, it's this woman you gave me. That's the problem. And, and dividing from each other. And you realize that, that love is broken by sin. And in fact, I I would say this, and I want you to hear this very clearly. Part of our being broken with not being loved as children like we wanted to be, with people who are mean to us, with abuses or whatever has happened in our lives, is that the very way in which we can receive love from God or from others gets, gets damaged. And even if somebody is loving us, I, I don't, can't, can't really feel it. I, I I find that in myself. Sometimes Jan's loving me well, but there's so many things going on in my head or, or in my heart that, that I'm not feeling it. It's not getting through because I can't receive it. And conversely, I can't give it very well. I, I've got damage on the receiving side of love and I'm damaged on the giving side of love. And I really believe that as, as we grow and mature as believers, that is a non-negotiable If Christ is at work in you, you're going to learn how to receive love better and how to give love better. And so those are the first two parts of the gospel. And the third part of the gospel is Jesus. And love was most powerfully and foundationally demonstrated by Jesus. So there's lots of other ways in which God has showed his love to us. And Again, you can say, God, thank you for your blessings, for my health, for the sunshine, for the country I live in, for the job I have, for the children I have, the spouses I have, you know, the spouse I have, not more than one. And you go through this process of being grateful to God because those things do demonstrate the love of God. But we have to have a rock solid foundation because sometimes the blessings go away. Let me explain that in just a minute. Here's the next two verses in 1 John. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You you see, this is the foundation. How do I know Jesus loves me? Because when I was lost, before I even existed, when I was angry with God, when I was sinful, Jesus came and he took on himself the suffering of being a human being. He took on himself the sin of the world. He took on himself such horrible death because of his love for you and me. It wasn't the nails that held him on that cross. It was his love for you and me. And you see, that's the, the proof for all time And when I'm feeling, because of circumstances in my life, that thank you, God, for my health, but my health doesn't last. Or thank you for this job, but the job doesn't last. You see, God's love is deeper and wider and richer than the blessings he gives us. And sometimes we love God because of. I love you because of what you've done for me. Instead of God, I love you because you have loved me and you've demonstrated it through Christ. So, We were created for love, first part of the gospel. Our brokenness hinders us from receiving and giving love, and that's part of the fall. Jesus is the ultimate demonstration, and he is the the life love for us and in us. And then lastly, when we go to heaven, it's not going to be pearly gates and jasper and all the beautiful things that are there that are going to really, really excite us. We are going to live in eternity in love. And we're going to be with not only the people that we love from earth, we're going to be with Jesus. And that's going to be ultimately what matters because that's ultimately what we were created for. So he sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for us. Why is that such a big deal? Knowing his cost, 
knowing that it was his love that empowered him to stay on the cross. That's what causes us to know we are loved even when we may not feel it. You see, that's an important distinction. Sometimes I don't feel loved, but I know that I am loved. And in fact, you look at John the Apostle's life. He got to be the one Jesus loved and he hung out with Jesus and he, was, he had this incredible privilege of having this deep personal relationship with Jesus while he was on earth. But then he failed him and ran away and he got to watch him be crucified. And, and then he watched all of his close friends, the disciples and the apostles and the other believers scattered and killed and jailed. And ultimately at the end of his life, he gets stuck on a lonely island and that's called Patmos. And, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. So the blessings that had been there to begin with didn't always stay the same. But the love of Jesus was always the same. What's the second part of this and where we're going to go for the whole series is that I am learning to love. That love is something that I not only learn to receive from God, but that part of the way that I am knowing if I'm really getting it that God loves me is it begins to overflow out of my life. It begins to affect my marriage relationships and my parenting and my friendships. And I am learning to love and spiritual maturity is always characterized by loving better and more. It's essential for spiritual life. It's essential for our relationships and for loving each other. But if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, it is essential that we grow in love. In fact, that's one of the great ways that you can say that somebody is growing spiritually is they're loving God more and loving other people better. And so look at 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm just going to read there. You don't have to look at it. I just want you to listen to this for a second. First three verses. Paul says, after he talks about all the spiritual gifts and how they have gotten off track, he says, let me show you a more excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. That first line says, even if I had all this spiritual giftedness, but I didn't have love, I would be like a clanging cymbal. So I have a clanging cymbal. You see, a, a cymbal in the midst of a drum set is nice add-on, but by itself, it's just noisy and brassy and, and frankly, arrogant. And he says, if I have all these great gifts, and even if I were to give my body, and the, the implication is to be martyred, to be burned at the stake, if you will. And isn't it incredible? He says, if I were to do all these very, very spiritual activities, like to the extreme, but I don't have them motivated out of a heart of love, then it's nothing. It, it reminds me of this math problem here. What's one times zero? Well, that's easy. That's zero. But 77 or 10,000 or a million. You see, this is the million spiritual activity category, feeding thousands of people. But I don't do it out of love. It's zero. What does that mean? That means love is incredibly important. That love is the foundation of all of our spiritual activities or else they're meaningless. And, and I have to tell you, I, I wrestle with that. It's easy, especially in professional ministry, to do spiritual activities, sometimes out of love for Christ and love for people, but sometimes it's out of obligation or it's my job or people need me or it, it's because I want to be noticed or there's all kinds of other reasons when I think about only the things that are done out of love count, that's a scary thought. And I want to know how I can access God's love better and how I can get better at, at being the kind of agape lover that, that God shows us how to be and that he calls us to be. So I want us to go on in 1 Corinthians 13 and, and say, what does love look like? Love is dot, dot, dot. What does that mean? Well, Paul fills that in in 1 Corinthians 13. And sometimes you hear it read at, it read at weddings and it sounds kind of poetic and, 
and beautiful. And honestly, when you start looking at, at, at the details of it, you're like, this is not only hard, this is impossible. So here's the definition. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And you know, let me give you a convicting exercise. Put, put your name in here in place of the word love. Joe is patient. Sally is kind. Paul does not envy. Paul does not boast. I don't know about you, but as soon as I put my own name in there, it's like, man, I'm not, oh, he's very patient. And I am easily in certain circumstances, unkind. And, and, I, and I thought this one down here is not self-seeking. Oh, man. How, how many things I do because I want to have appreciation come back or, or maybe even a sense of obligation that if I'll do this for you, maybe you'll do something nice for me. So this is beautiful and poetic, but it is incredibly heart-piercing. And then he goes on and he says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then here's the cap. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And I want to give you an encouraging exercise. Instead of saying it or love, I want you to put God's name in here. God always protects me. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. See, that's the, when we move too quickly to, this is the way that I need to learn how to love. I don't know about you, but I feel overwhelmed and inadequate and like, I am not good at that. But when you turn it around and you say, this is how God loves me. And if I can really believe that, that how patient God is with me, that helps me be patient. How kind God is, how gracious he is with me, that helps me be able to be patient and kind in those circumstances. So love is essential. Love is clearly defined in the scripture. And then lastly, love is only transferable, which seems like kind of a weird sentence. But what I mean is you can't manufacture it. Frankly, the love that you have is love that you've received. And if you were fortunate enough to live in a home where you were well-loved, if you've had close friendships throughout your life, if you've had a spouse that cared about you, if you've had children who have given you love, then you are probably far more able to learn to love. If you were not loved as a child and not loved in your marriage and not loved by your children, man, it's so easy for us to become cold and bitter and cynical and build up a wall around ourselves. So love is transferable, but if you are depending on human sources, you will inevitably be disappointed. Because no matter how well your parents love you, it's never perfectly. And no matter how well your spouse loves you, it will not be perfectly. No matter how well your friends love you, it will not be perfectly. And so if you come back to what... I need to learn how to love better. I need to come back to the basics. I cannot give love that I have not received. So where do I go to get that kind of love? I have to go to God because God is the source of the agape love. God is the source of of love that is unconditional. Let me tell you a story that I hope really brings this home for you. Pastor Ed likes to share his own story, especially we, we as a staff maybe get the longer version of it, but it's really an impacting story because Ed grew up in a pastor's home and, and he learned all about ministry very early on in his life and gave his life to Christ at a young age. And then he went on to a life of serving in ministry for 15, 17 years. But somehow embedded in that understanding of ministry and God was, was this sense that, that he prayed for salvation and God had given him a a right to get to heaven and to be a child of God, but that all of the rest of the work had to be done to please God. And Ed was trying so hard to please God. 
But at the end of that 15, 17 years, he got out of ministry and he was deeply disappointed with the church and disappointed with Christians and frankly disappointed with God. Because in his way of understanding it, God had not kept the promises. He had worked really hard to please God and nothing seemed to work out. And he wasn't happy and he wasn't peaceful and it doesn't seem like any of the scripture was true. And so he went, got out of ministry and he just got a job. And he said, I would drive back and forth from home to work. And first of all, in Elkton and then in Sutherland. And I would be thinking and wrestling. And, and he said, I realized that one of the primary failures is I didn't really believe God loved me. And he said, you know, I, I actually believed as I read through the scriptures that this picture of grace, and he was going to a church that heavily emphasized grace, and that there was nothing I had to do to please God because he was already pleased, and that Jesus had died for my sins. I didn't need to, to try to pay for them myself, and all of these concepts. And he said, what it really came down to is it felt like heresy to say God's love is unconditional. And there's kind of that fear if you tell people that God loves you and he forgives you that these sinful vermin are just going to go out and do everything wrong. And he said, you know, I was afraid. It was a risk. And he said, the more I read the scripture and the more he, because he was still seeking after God even though he was completely out of ministry. And he said, I came to a startling decision one day. He said, I was driving in to work thinking about it. And he said, you know, what, what if it's true? What if God really loves me personally and deeply and unconditionally and he's already pleased and I don't have to work to try to keep him happy? And he said, I, I'm gonna try that on for a week and just see how it feels. See what changes. And so for a week, he chose to believe that God loved him with that kind of unconditional love. And he said at the end of the week, it wasn't a perfect week, but he said, it was better. He said, I'm gonna try this another week. And he went week at a time until he got to a month and he said, I'm going to risk a whole month. And he said, I slowly began to watch myself change and I began to experience God's love and I began to have peace and I began to, to see things in a different light and see people in a different way. And he said, at the end of three months, I said, I am going to keep believing this as long as it keeps working. And uh, here we are 30 some years later and it's still working. But that battle that goes on in our heart that says, do I believe that God loves me? Paul says in Ephesians 3, he says, I, I hope you could understand the, how wide and how deep and how high and how, he just uses all these terms to say, I wish you could understand how incredible the love of God is. And then he says, and to experience it, to know the love of God that's beyond comprehension. And our desire for you in this series is that you might know a little bit more of the love of God, that you might experience in your life, and that you might be able to live loved. I'm going to hand off to the campuses, whether physical or online, and I want you to not only walk through a couple of questions here, but I want you to spend this week really chewing on this thought. Do I really believe God loves me? Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jason and I am so grateful that you're here to walk alongside us as we examine the unconditional love of God. And as Pastor Paul shared Pastor Ed's story where he really wrestled with receiving the love of God and he, for him the barrier was, it's risky. If I really believe God loves me despite what I've done, wouldn't that just cause me to want to walk in sin all the more? And so for him, the barrier to receiving love was risk. He felt like he might just wander off into sin. And the question is for, for you and for me, what is that barrier? Are you experiencing the love of God? Or do you really believe, I'm, I'm just not worthy. There's no way God could love me. Or do you maybe believe, yeah, God loves his people generally, but he doesn't love me specifically. What is that barrier for you? And it's a key part to understanding how to receive God is what is the barrier that you're experiencing? And so the two challenges we really want to leave you with today, firstly, is to choose every day this week to actively believe that God really loves you. That despite your circumstance, despite whether you've done great that day or you've blown it, that God genuinely loves you and that he displayed that on the cross. And then the second thing we wanna challenge you to is to read the devotions every day this week. Pastor Paul put in an immense effort to, to focus all of these devotions on the love of God. 
You see, if we're ever going to make the transition to believing and receiving the love of God, we can't do it on our own. We need truth to counter the lies in our minds. And so we want to be rooted in God's word. So we want to challenge all of us to be reading those devotions this week. And I believe that as we are examining the love of God in scripture and allowing it to transform our hearts and minds, we will experience receiving the love of Christ. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice for us, where your your love was displayed in a huge way on the cross, where you took my penalty, you took the debt that I owed and you paid it. You died in my place, the death that I deserve. And God, I pray that as a church, corporately, but also individually, that all of us, we would experience the love of God in a very real way, God, that you would help us to break down those barriers where we don't believe that you could really love us and that that we would begin to walk in the freedom of your love. Jesus, thank you so much for the cross, the perfect example of love. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you guys again so much for joining us. I hope that you'll stick with us through this series as we examine the implications of God's love in our relationships. I'll see you next week.